Back in the 90s, a team of engineers from McDonnell Douglas's Phantom Works developed and tested a unique stealth aircraft, shrouded in the secrecy of Area 51 and known to most as simply the Bird of Prey. While most stealth programs are known for their high costs, the Bird of Prey went from a pad of paper to the skies over Area 51 for less than the cost of a single F-35 today. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. In October of 1983, the Lockheed F-117 Nighthawk secretly entered service for the U.S. Air Force, marking the world's first operational stealth aircraft. While the Nighthawk carried the F prefix designated to fighters and was even commonly known as the Stealth Fighter, the Nighthawk was actually no fighter at all. With no onboard radar, no guns, and a payload capacity limited to just two 2,000-pound bombs, the F-117 Nighthawk was an attack aircraft masquerading as a fighter. But let there be no mistake, it was an attack aircraft unlike anything the world had ever seen. After decades of focus on fielding faster, higher-flying aircraft as a means of defeating enemy air defenses, the Nighthawk served as a pivot point for the very direction of aviation technology and air warfare doctrine among the world's most powerful nations. The Nighthawk was slow and even cumbersome compared to the F-15s and F-16s already in Air Force hangars. But in a world where America's smallest fighter carried a radar cross-section of 82 square feet, the F-117 carried a radar cross-section only slightly larger than a tenth of an inch. For all intents and purposes, the Nighthawk was practically invisible to enemy radar. Less than a decade later, Lockheed's YF-22 would square off with Northrop's YF-23 for the Air Force's Advanced Tactical Fighter contract, which would bring the world's first real stealth fighter to fruition. But at the same time, back at Area 51, McDonnell Douglas's Phantom Works had stealth aims of their own, and they had just the man they needed to pursue them. Unlike Lockheed and Northrop's high-performance stealth fighters that benefited from direct tax funding, McDonnell Douglas alone was picking up the tab for their new stealth aircraft's development. And in order to be sure that all that money didn't just go to waste, they tapped Alan Weichmann to head up the effort. Weichmann cut his teeth at Lockheed Skunk Works, where he worked on the Have Blue program and its operational successor, the aforementioned F-117. He then went on to join the team behind Lockheed Sea Shadow, aimed at fielding stealth warships for the U.S. Navy. After McDonnell Douglas's proposal for the Advanced Tactical Fighter Program was rejected outright by the Air Force in favor of Lockheed and Northrop's entries, McDonnell Douglas hired Weichmann to get their low observable efforts back on track and to help found their Phantom Works division. In the annals of aviation history, Weichmann's name doesn't pop up as often as other legendary engineers of the day, like Clarence Kelly Johnson. In fact, Aviation Week ranks him as perhaps the lowest profile engineer among their list of secret pioneers of stealth aviation. But widespread recognition isn't always a good measure of accomplishment, and indeed, Weichmann's contributions to stealth aviation were so numerous that he received a Technical Achievement Award from the National Defense Industrial Association for his work in low-observable aircraft before the bird of prey was even declassified. I'll go ahead and quote that award now. Because of Weichmann's work, the United States gained a 15-year lead over potential adversaries that it has not relinquished, and the effectiveness of his designs and products have been thoroughly proven in combat operations. With Weichmann at the helm, work began in 1992 under the innocuous enough-sounding name of YF-118G. Wakeman's team at the Phantom Works obviously had to be budget conscious, so as they went about designing their new stealth aircraft, they leveraged a then-novel approach of rapid prototyping. See, rather than designing physical prototypes, subjecting them to testing, making changes, and then fielding new prototypes for further testing, the Phantom Works team used computers to aid in their design work, simulating performance to the best of the era's computing abilities. 
As a result, they were able to produce prototype components that were far closer to the finished product than previous approaches would have allowed. But that wasn't the only way Weichmann's team got creative in their approach to building this new aircraft. They also leveraged cutting-edge single-piece composite structure designs that eliminated many of the body panel seams that can compromise an aircraft's stealth profile. This approach would help keep costs down because mass-producing aircraft with no substantial seams or tiny gaps between body panels attached to the fuselage remains one of the more challenging aspects of stealth aircraft construction, and in fact some contend that it's something Russian stealth fighter programs continue to struggle with to this very day. But Weichmann and his team weren't set on reinventing every wheel, and they really leveraged as many off-the-shelf components as they could to both keep costs down and to expedite the whole design process. The Pratt & Whitney JT-15D-5C turbofan engine they chose, for instance, produced just 3,190 pounds of thrust, and it would have been much more at home in something like a Cessna business jet. The ejection seat came from an AV-8B Harrier, the control stick and throttle from an FA-18 Hornet, and the rudder pedals came from an A-4 Skyhawk. In fact, there was such an emphasis on digging through the bargain bin for parts that Air Force test pilot Colonel Doug Benjamin once joked that the clock was from Walmart and the environmental control system was essentially a hairdryer. Hairdryer or not, by 1996, just four years after the program started, Weichmann's team had a flyable prototype ready to prove the efficacy of their approach. The single-engine, single-seat technology demonstrator they'd constructed stretched some 47 feet, or just a bit longer than an F-16 Fighting Falcon. Its angular, gull-shaped wings diverged dramatically from other fighter designs, angling up and then down for a total span of just 23 feet, or 10 feet shorter than that same F-16. But the most conspicuous departure from traditional fighter design was in its blended fuselage and complete lack of tail section. This new design took a holistic approach to stealth, reducing radar, infrared, visual, and acoustic signatures through its shape, the use of flexible or movable covers to conceal gaps, and by burying its engine deep within the fuselage, behind a curved inlet duct and in front of an infrared and acoustic diffusing exhaust outlet. Once complete, the aircraft's strange shape and aggressive posture reminded the team of the looming warship operated by Star Trek's warrior race, the Klingons, so it wasn't long before they all started calling it the Bird of Prey, after the ship first depicted in Star Trek III, The Search for Spock. On September 11, 1996, the Bird of Prey took to the skies over Groom Lake, also known as Area 51, for the first time, with Air Force Colonel Doug Benjamin at the stick. And much like its Bird of Prey namesake that would cloak to hide from enemy starships, Boeing's Bird of Prey would have to rely on stealth, rather than impressive performance, to get the job done. Colonel Benjamin brought the aircraft off the ground and left its landing gear extended, identifying the first of a number of problems. Throughout wind tunnel testing, the platform had performed well, but all of the tests were conducted with the landing gear retracted. Benjamin soon realized that the drag created by the gear was at least three times worse than they had anticipated. The aircraft suffered from stability issues as well, but they were all slowly and meticulously worked out in subsequent flights. Over the next three years, the team would execute 37 more successful flights with the single Bird of Prey prototype they'd constructed, flown by Benjamin and two Boeing test pilots, Rudy Hogg and Joseph W. Felock III, and I apologize if I mispronounced either of those names. Despite its tailless design and gull wings, the aircraft was considered aerodynamically stable without the sort of computer correction modern stealth fighters relied on by the time it took its final flight in 1999. With a cruising speed of only around 300 miles per hour, the stealthy aircraft was slower than a C-130 Hercules, and its maximum operating ceiling of 20,000 feet meant it could fly less than half as high as a P-51 Mustang from World War II. But like the F-117 Nighthawk Weichmann worked on before it, the Bird of Prey wasn't aiming to outfly the fighters of its day. Its goals were much further reaching than that. You see, not only had the Phantom Works team proven that they too could build a stealth aircraft, 
they had managed to do it all for under $67 million. Adjusted for inflation to today's currency, that means Weichmann's Phantom Works successfully designed, prototyped, and flew a clean sheet stealth platform for around $111 million, or less than the cost of a single F-35B today. I'm going to go ahead and quote Jim Elba, the president and CEO of Boeing Integrated Defense Systems back in 2002. Early investments in technology demonstration projects, such as Bird of Prey, have positioned Boeing to help shape our industry's transformation. We changed the rules on how to design and build an aircraft. In 1999, Boeing's Bird of Prey took flight for the last time, but that wasn't quite the end of its story. The breakthroughs and lessons learned throughout the program soon found their way into another platform that made its first flight just months before the Bird of Prey was finally unveiled to the public in 2002, the X-45A Unmanned Combat Air Vehicle. Like the Bird of Prey, the X-45A was a product of Boeing's Phantom Works, but unlike its Klingon cousin, the X-45A was designed to fly autonomously. According to Boeing, the X-45A's design was largely derived from the Bird of Prey program, with the UCAV adopting elements of its predecessor's radar-defeating angular design and unusual dorsal intake. Boeing has also credited some of the design techniques leveraged for the Bird of Prey in their development of the X-32, which of course would ultimately lose out to Lockheed Martin for the Joint Strike Fighter contract just one year after the Bird of Prey program was shuttered. Today, there are no platforms in service that can draw a direct lineage to Alan Weichmann's unusual bird of prey, and that may be part of the reason it's not a frequently discussed facet of the American industrial stealth technology race that came at the twilight of the Cold War. But for a short time in the 90s, the Phantom Works proved that it doesn't always take a bottomless budget and 20 years worth of delays to build a stealth fighter. And that's a lesson America is still struggling to learn, even decades after the bird of prey prowled the skies over Area 51. While never intended to manifest as an operational stealth fighter, the bird of prey prototype did eventually find a home with its stealth siblings of its day. At the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, you can find it in the museum's modern flight gallery, hanging right above their F-22 Raptor. And with that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. But before we go, I want to take a quick second to introduce you to Luke Ryan's new post-apocalyptic novel, The First Marauder. Luke Ryan is a former army ranger and a genuine war hero who also happens to be a good friend of the channel. This book isn't a paid sponsor, it's just an excellent novel, and I really recommend you grab a copy. I'll leave a link down below in the description. As always, please swing by sandboxnews.com for the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, don't forget to click like and subscribe and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.